Sisters, we are the elders of the Gavin of Christ Church. We have myself, Elder Rikashiar, along with Elder Lawyer. We're here on this Sabbath to go into a detailed lesson on what? The geographical location of the laws. When I say that, the wilderness, the place the Most High gave his commandments. Why am I going here today, you might ask? Well, we've mentioned that Israel has been scattered throughout the four corners of the earth, the true children of Israel. Why? Because Israel, the children of God, broke the laws. So it's no coincidence at the very end. There's no doubt in anyone's mind that we are in an Ethian times. That we must bring validity and understanding according to archaeology that, that there was a place we received the laws that were broken. Mm -hmm. The children of Israel were scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. Why? Because Israel broke the laws contained in the Bible. Let me show you something here. What I have in my hand here is a King James Version Bible with the Apocrypha included. Now, what we are about to show today, I personally don't expect everyone out there to receive it, even when proven as true. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, the law, statutes, and commandments were given to the people of the book. And there's an, a serious conspiracy amongst the nations to discredit it. The whole thing from the beginning of the sojourn in Egypt to the slavery Moses and the Exodus, the conquest of the Promised Land, is all there in one nice, neat line, but it's way too early. I don't believe there was a single event that we can call the Exodus. This person can't have seen all this. He imagined it. I'm very much against chronological revisionism. There is nothing else like this in the whole of Egyptian history. Really? Nothing at all. When you put those cities side by side, the biblical account and the archaeology match extremely well. So far, there is no documented evidence about the Exodus. Exodus did not happen in the way that it is described in the text. Knowing that there's prophecies in the book, which leads to the freedom and upliftment of the children of Israel throughout the four corners. So I'm going to go into this about the laws and the geographical location of where our foreparents received them. Why? The religious powers, as well as the political powers, the Gentile nations, those that are over the New World Order or quote unquote Illuminati. Well, these are they who are over ancient archaeologists. 
and how it's interpreted to the layman. They're over history. So it's in their interest to put out history to discredit what gives freedom to the elect. The elect will continue to suffer pearls through Jacob's trouble. Why? We will continue to suffer, mm -hmm. and they know it. Mm -hmm. Because the laws were given to Israel. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's the nation's, it's, 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 it's really the Gentiles and the Masons' agenda to keep us from ever believing there was a law or a place that the Most High gave us geographically, the law. A place where the Most High said, in scriptures, he would come down and give the law from heavens to the earth. So what did the Romans do once we fell? Well, the Romans and the sons of Ishmael, which are Arabs, conspired together to hide any archeology span and any place that would connect us back to that law. We're gonna show this today. So we'll know beyond any shadow of a doubt according to scriptures, where is the geographical area Moses gave the commandments of the, of the Most High to the children of Israel. And guess what? We have archeology, span we have pictures. Picture says a thousand words. And we have scriptural proof. So instead of going through the conspirators to verify the Bible, we will now go into the Bible and use that as the blueprint and point out the geographical air areas according to scriptures. Areas that you can find today. Now, if what I'm saying is correct, that means there is a God of Israel. The Bible is true. Okay? It also means that the laws contained in them has value for the people of God. I don't expect those that, that are in the Christian church to receive this, a lot of them. No disrespect to them because a lot of them are great people. But they are taught the laws are done away with. So automatically, when they hear Moses, it's turned off, not realizing that the scriptures prophesied Christ during the time of Moses. Christ is an extension of Moses to finish what Moses could not complete. What is that? Bring the children of Israel back home. To give them their kingdom. Now. Why is this important? Your universities. Your higher schools of learning. And your religious institutions. Questions the Bible. Or put the Bible on the same platform as mythology. Mm -hmm. And, and then leave it up to the layman to decide if that's something they should choose just like any other religion or any other book. Well, that doesn't fly for our people. Okay? The Arabs cannot give me their book and say, that's my way of life. The Romans cannot give me their history and their theology and claim that that's my way of life. Okay? We must get it from the source. Because most people in the earth today questions the Bible and put it on the same plane as mythology, Recently, France became the 14th country to legalize same-sex marriage. Here in the United States, only 12 states, plus the District of Columbia, allow gay couples to marry. But more and more states are on deck now to change their laws. The social tide among Americans has shifted dramatically. 
1996, a Gallup poll showed that 27% of Americans supported gay marriage. Last year, that number had nearly doubled to 53%. Would you call this a social revolution or a cultural shift? Both. 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 I think, and I think it's interesting, having, we just talked about violence and, and gun control. I think that the more we as a nation have suffered, the more our hearts have opened. And we're mm. more willing to accept mm. what I personally think should have been accepted a long time ago. So a lot of people were afraid that this meant that the, afraid again, that the institution of marriage as we know it would fall apart. Does this mean uh, if gay marriage is legalized in more than 12 states, if it becomes a dominant force in the United States, does that mean that the institution of marriage has to be re-examined? It's going to be enriched. It's going to be enriched. Ooh, good. I've never had a straight couple come to me and say, my marriage is in trouble because of the gay couple living next door. To the contrary, I've had people come to me and say, because of the love between Bob and Joe, I have learned how better to love my wife or my husband. What happens now? Lawlessness has, has ran rapid throughout the earth. Sin, people with, with low morality, no pure morals, no honor, no respect, why? Where there's no law, there's chaos. That's what the new world order powers want. They want a world of chaos. Mm -hmm. So they can automatically have that world by attacking the Bible and saying that these laws in the Bible never happened. There was never a children of God. There were never people of the most high. All things are relative and people are individuals and do what they want to do. There's no one way. One of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way to live That's and right. that we don't accept that there are diverse ways of being in the world, that there are millions of ways to be a then human being and, and many ways, no, but many paths to what you call God. That and her path crazy. might be something else and when she gets there she might call it the light. But her loving and her kindness and her generosity brings her, if it brings her to the same point that it brings you, it doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. And I guess the danger that could be on that, I mean, it's, it sounds great on the onset, but if you really look at both sides, I there could possibly be just one way. What, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? I only one way. There is one way and only one way and there that is through Jesus. Jesus. There couldn't possibly be with because the you say people in the world. Isn't. There could possibly be. Because you say, you intellectualize it and say there isn't. If you no. don't believe that, you're all buying into the lie. But that means if the Bible is true and these places we show are correct and you can reach them yourself today and go see them yourselves, that substantiates the scriptures and let and let us know that these laws are real. There's a place we received the laws. We went away from, from them. Let me just give you a few scriptures on the law real quick. And then I'm going to go into the place that's standing today, that exists today, where Israel, the children of Israel, received the law. We're going to give you geographical locations today, according to scripture. Now, all right, thank you. All right, going right into it. The geographical location of the mount, Moses received the law and delivered that law to the children of the Most High. Now, I wanted to go into the fact that in the end days, in the end times, the so-called Masons under Albert Pike during the uh, uh, the end of the 19th century, made a proclamation that at the very end they will culminate a fictitious war against Christians and Muslims and eradicate religion and attack the Bible. Door de recente gebeurtenissen in Parijs en de associatie tussen ISIS en de islam ligt het islamitische geloof steeds vaker onder vuur. Zo worden moslims ervan beschuldigd dat hun geloof niet aansluit op onze westerse idealen. Maar hoe zit het dan eigenlijk met het christendom? Het geloof waarop onze cultuur grotendeels gebouwd is. 
Een vrouw moet zich laten onderwijzen in stilheid, in alle onderdanigheid. Volgens dit hele boek is de vrouw uh, in principe onderdanig. Voor dit experiment hebben we een Bijbel gekocht en deze omgetoverd tot een Koran. Hierin hebben we schokkende passages gehighlight die sterk in contrast staan met onze westerse normen en waarden. Eens kijken wat er gebeurt als we de citaten uit de Bijbel voorleggen aan de mensen op straat, maar zich in de volgende stelling laten dat ze uit de Koran komen. Hey, what's up guys? It's me, Kareem from Are We Famous Now? You might have seen a video with two German guys walking around with a Bible disguised as a Quran. I thought it was a great idea, so I took it upon myself to try it in New York City and see how people would react. I have my Bible that is disguised as a Quran, as you can see. If evidence of virginity is not found in the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house and have the men of the city stone her to death. Women should be kept silent in places of worship, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission. If a wife does not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. And if there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. Everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Kind of harsh. Yeah, yeah, that's really harsh. What? Whoa. <laughs> that's so f***ed up. I think that's bullshit. It oppresses women so much and it's not fair. It's just so wow. graphic and yeah. unnecessary. What seems really outdated. Definitely an old thing that should have should be a, a relic, not a not still here today. Times change, people need to change with it, I think. Yeah. That's totally extreme. We don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> Husbands don't know much, you know. Women are like a dog or something like that. It creates this, like image where like they're dogs and like, you know, they need permission to get out into this. It's a little messed up. But first of all, it's none of my business. Uh -huh. It's not my religion. Uh -huh. So I have to respect what they believe. I mean, obviously we live in a different day and age than when this was written, but uh, I mean, that was, you know, the way it was back then. People grow, they progress, yeah. things change. Compared to the Bible, how is the Bible? The Bible is like, oh, the glory of God, everyone's equal yeah. and everything. Okay, so what if I told you this, that this is actually the Bible? Oh, shit! What? <laughs> what? Oh, That's the no. Bible? Yeah. Wait. I never learned about Wait. that. Yeah. You never learned about that in church like, school? This is actually the Bible. Wow. Son of a gun. What if I told you this was the Bible, not the Quran? Well, I haven't got time now. We gotta take off. All right, so what if I told you that this actually was the Bible? Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Wow, <right>? Jesus. <laughs> so this is indeed the Bible. Oh. <laughs> so, this actually is the Bible. I thought so. <laughs> I read that, oh, the that's part a good about one. the daughter, the... Well, it's not right. Oh, wow. <laughs> I would believe it. That's really I would believe that yeah. as well, because yeah. there are very there are correlations between all religions. I wouldn't have expected that. Really? I was raised Catholic, so... Oh, wow. I would tell you, though, this is the Bible, actually. Have a nice day. And, and bring forth lawlessness throughout the whole earth to usher out Lucifer as the god of this new world. So it's no wonder at the very end, there's lawlessness and there's no belief, uncertainty, not sure, don't care. So we want to take you way back to when the laws was instituted, why? Brothers and sisters, we understand why the Gentile nations are lawless. They didn't receive the law. So how can they now become the authority over, over a book and a law that wasn't given to them and, and look to discredit it. How can you discredit something that you were never the authority of? Okay, you are the authority of a Gentile rule. See, but they needed to utilize the Bible during the time of our fall, the time that our forefathers were in captivity. They, they had to grab that bit of morality, that book of law, that substantiates everything, that, that links the whole earth into what happened in the beginning. The laws concerning God's people and the judgment on the nations and why, and why there's a, a future judgment on them. They had to get inside and take our book so that they can now spin it their way through theology. Who did this? The Rosicrucians and the Jesuits, the Roman Catholic Church. So that if they can give you a false idea of a book and then expose their falsehoods that they've created at the very end, 
they realized that the majority of the world, our people, the people of God, would eventually throw out the baby with the bathwater and live in lawlessness without conscience. So we need to take you way back to show you God did come down on the mount, the Most High God. He did give a people a law. Christ came under that same law to fulfill it. And in order for us to receive this kingdom, we, as Christ did, must receive and understand and follow the laws. Okay? Now, the archaeologists are lying to you. They gave us a false place for the Mount of Horeb or the Mount of Laws where the laws were given to Moses. They gave us a false geographical locations. The Arabs and the Romans, the Edomites, were behind this conspiracy so that we can believe now that the Bible is a fallacy and all the archaeology points to the fact that there is no Israelites. It never happened. Mm -hmm. See? But we want to prove them false. Liars. First of all, let's get into the law. For the last couple of weeks in the academy, we did a dispensation. We did something different. We figured that we would take two weeks strictly to go into some law so that brothers and sisters in our academy would understand the do's and don'ts according to Moses and the grace that was given under Christ not to break the law. But that grace was from the penalties of that law and showed how Christ fulfilled the sacrificial part of the law. We went into that for the last couple of weeks. Now we're going into the geographical location where our forefathers received the law. I mentioned before this went out that I don't expect the Gentiles and the other nations to receive this who are dealing with alternative religions or questioning the Bible. Why? Let's go to Psalms 147 real quick. The book of Psalms, chapter 147, verse 19. He showeth his word unto Jacob. <coughs> we begin. He showeth his word unto Jacob. He showeth his word unto Jacob. <coughs> his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. Read it. He showeth his word unto Jacob. His statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He showeth his word unto Jacob. What's his word? <coughs> the Bible. He showeth his word unto Jacob. Who's Jacob? Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the word or the Bible or the book was only showed to a specific people. Now, during this time, when the laws were given to Moses, the Edomites had their religion, the Canaanite religion. The Egyptians had their religion. The Arabs had their religion. <coughs> right? But this word was showed unto who? Unto Jacob. Come on. His statutes and his judgments unto Israel. His statutes and his judgments unto Israel. Israel are the people of the book. Read. Verse 20. He have not dealt so with any nation. He have not what? He have not dealt so with any nation. So I don't expect the nations to agree with the book. <coughs> If the Mosai said he have not dealt so with any nation, today the nations can question whether or not this book is valid. Why? Filling it doesn't apply to them. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Living in the selfish world, most people only give validity to something that they have value in or something that gives them some level of authority or credit. When you look at the Bible and you say, well, if these people are not me, then thank you, sister. If these people are, are not me and it wasn't given to my people, why should I care about Bible it, right? But suppose you are the children of Israel. Suppose the laws do apply to you. Suppose the curses on the book applies to you, but not them. That means it's in the nation's benefit to teach you that the law is done away with 
to keep you in servitude. It's in their benefit. They can break the law and get everything while we suffer. Why? Because the laws were given to us. Wonder why things ain't working out. We always oppress all the nations have everything over us. Well, that was prophesied. To whom much is given, much is required. Read. He have not dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. As for the most high judgments, the nations have never known them. Why? It wasn't given to them. Right? Read. Praise ye the most high. Uh -huh. Praise ye the most high. So the laws were given to us, our forefathers. Now, why do I say us? I know that beyond any shadow of a doubt that the people who were scattered throughout the four corners of the earth, who went to the went in the belly of slave ships and served captivity according to this same law are the children of God. Read Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, and 64. The, the same geographical location we receive the, these books, the law, will be revealed today. <clears throat> Come on. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 64. And the Most High shall scatter thee among all people. So it tells us, according to the scriptures, that the real children of Israel, after breaking the law, read the 15th verse. Verse 15. Come on. But what? it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Most High, thy power. Come on. To observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee, or and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. That all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. What curses? Deuteronomy 28 and 64. Deuteronomy 28 and 64. And the Most High Ahiah shall scatter thee among all people. You will be scattered amongst all people. That means you will lose your homeland, Israel, and get scattered throughout the earth. And what? From the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And do what? And there thou shalt serve other gods. And there thou shalt serve what? Other gods. Other gods. Which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. Even wood and stone. Even wood and stone. Right? <clears throat> Serve other gods, even wood and stone. Wood is your cross in Christianity, and stone is your Kaaba stone in Mecca. <laughs> See? Here's the true curses of the people of God. See, that's how we know. You no, know, we just tell them the truth. That's how we know the Jewish people are not the people. Mm. They weren't scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. That never happened. Anytime they come to some level of oppression or or story concerning uh, 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 oppression or some level of uh, negativity done towards them, they just bring up the Holocaust. That just happened what? Some not not even 60 years ago, 60, 70 years ago. If that. When Israel had been suffering atrocities under the hand of the Romans since 70 AD. So they try to come off at the very end with their own sad story, so that we can't to divert us from, from the curses con contained in the Bible. To divert us. Okay, if that happened to you, that's fine. We didn't do that to you. That's number one. So don't come to us about that. Number two, that was Germans, which we know are the same family as Jewish people who did that to you. That has nothing to do with the curses contained in the Bible. But they did that so that now when the truth comes concerning the children of Israel in the end times, they can come with it too and say, well, we have our atrocities also and downplay the curses that were put on the children of Israel. 
Right. Now they can tie their so-called oppression to ours. Okay? When they're not the people. Christ wasn't Jewish. Paul wasn't Jewish. The Israelites weren't Jew Jewish. Okay? They were Israelites. There's a clear, distinct difference. Okay, that means a Chinese person today who's of the tribe of, <clears throat> who's, of who, who's of of the, of the nation of Japheth can convert to Judaism and be Jewish. That doesn't determine their bloodline and their connection to the law, statutes, and commandments. They're not suffering the curses of the physical people is what we're showing you here. So I'm not here to I'm not here to bash them. I'm just showing those out there listening the distinct difference. Your religion and what you what you believe on and what religion religion you've converted to does not distinguish you to the bloodline or does not connect you to the bloodline of Israel in the Bible. Okay. So it tells us that the curses were put on a certain people. Deuteronomy 28, 64, and they will be scattered. Right. While getting scattered, they would lose their identity. By who? Who would do this to them? The nations they're serving. By default, if a nation, <clears throat> if a nation enslaved you, you must do what? You must acquiesce or bow to the religion of that particular nation. Is that clear? So the brand of Christianity we received in captivity wasn't the Christianity before captivity. The religions we're receiving in Islam today and all that, that wasn't what we were following. Okay? So during our captivity, and I'm speaking of the North American Indians and all of them too, they served too, even though they didn't come over in slave ships originally, they got into North, Central, and South America around the 8th century B.C. And eventually, the Romans found them too. Why do you wish to sail west? To open a new route to Asia. Asia is the richest kingdom, the land of spices and gold. At the moment, there are only two ways of reaching it. By sea, sailing around the African continent, the journey takes a year, or by land, but the Turks have closed this road to all Christians. There is a third way. By sailing west across the ocean sea. The distance is unknown. It's said to be infinite. infinite. Superstition. I believe the Indies are no more than 750 leagues west of the Canary Islands. How can you be so certain? The calculations of uh, Toscanelli, Maradotti, Esdras. Esdras is a Jew. So what's worse? What did Columbus do when he first made landfall? Quote, rape, murder, and enslavement. Again, the record is solid. Like, the record shows that there are letters written from his best friend, the person closest to Columbus, where he's describing how it was just on a normal day. He just rapes women on a normal day. Like, they'll show up. He'll force them to be naked. At first, sometimes they struggle, and then he whips them, and they don't struggle, and then he rapes them. And then there was one, there was one line about how by the time I was through with her, it's like she was taught by a group of whores. Oh. Okay, his uh, his lead priest who was with him, same thing, they would casually have conversations about how they enslaved the people uh, and how they murdered people on a regular basis. I, again, I love the irony of these people viewing themselves as Christians. Situation, Old Mexico is ripe for conquest. Mission sees land resources and native peoples. Execution lead 500 well-trained Spanish conquistadors. Administration, in the name of the King of Spain. Command and control, Captain General Hernán Cortés. 
Nearly 500 years ago, Spanish conquistadors began their conquest of the Americas. The most successful of them all was Hernán Cortés. When Cortés and his men first landed in Mexico in 1519, they carried weapons like this, finely tempered Spanish swords. The people he faced, the Aztecs under Montezuma, were still using relatively primitive weapons, like this obsidian blade. Now, obsidian is sharp, but it's very fragile. No match for Spanish steel. April 1519. The Spanish mission to conquer Mexico is in big trouble. Its leader, Conquistador Hernán Cortés, is facing mutiny from his own troops. They want to end the expedition at Veracruz and return to Cuba, but there's no turning back for Cortés. And he'll make it impossible for any retreat by committing one of the most daring acts in the history of conquest. He burns his own ships. Now, the only option for his soldiers is victory or death. And victory depends on the leadership, diplomacy, audacity, and cunning of one man. Conquistador Hernán Cortés. Cortés knew that he must leave his homeland to seek the fame and fortune he desired. He took his chance alongside other Spaniards sailing to the New World. In 1504, 19-year-old Hernán Cortés landed at Hispaniola, the Spanish colony now known as the Dominican Republic. At age 25, Cortés became a friend of a well-known conquistador named Diego Velázquez de Cuellar. Cortés joined Velázquez in his conquest of Cuba. By 1511, Cuba was conquered, and Velázquez became its first governor. Those who came with him, including Cortés, were rewarded with land on the island. And enslaved them, and brought them over to Spain and different areas to serve uh, by, by the means of ships also. Why am I going into this? Like I said from the beginning, we're going back to the geographical location today where Israel gave our poor parents the law and exposed these so-called lion archaeologists and historians who are looking discred to discredit the Bible. <clears throat> so when we received the law, eventually our forefathers began to follow the, the ways of the Gentiles. <clears throat> we began to worship and deal like the Gentiles, the lawless people. So the Most High said in Deuteronomy 32, well, if you want to put up a new God for me, I'll put up a new people for you. I'll scatter you throughout the four corners of the earth. <clears throat> you non-appreciative people, I've given you everything. I'll scatter you. Now we're serving, looking for our God, falling in snares and traps by the Gentiles. Every which way we look, there's a trap set by a Gentile to dissuade us from our book. The book is the answer. The Bible, the book, this book is our map back. And I'm going to show you today. Because there's no law. We're living in a world of lawlessness. Okay. <clears throat> the Bible is important. When we were scattered, what happened? Let's go to Jeremiah 17. I'll show you why the Bible is important. <clears throat> Jeremiah 17. Read four and five, please. Book of Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 4. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. So what happened? <clears throat> Israel broke the law, and the Most High fulfilled his promise that he would scatter us. And through that captivity, Israel would discontinue from the heritage that he gave us. So we would go throughout the whole earth wandering, wondering who's our God. A generation being passed, amnesia being passed down to the next generation. 
Okay, we just exist. We're just black. We're just people. See? And we'll pass this to our children. The Gentiles teach us their traditions, and we'll give those traditions to our children. Discontinuing from the heritage of the Bible. The Bible is a heritage. See? I'm not talking about Christmas, Sunday worship, Easter. We learn that in captivity. Okay? We must learn the original schoolmaster. Where do we come from? Who's our true God? <clears throat> not what the Gentiles want us to believe. Because by default, if we listen to anything they have to say, they're above us. And the Most High said that he would put us above all people of the earth. <clears throat> Let's get that. Deuteronomy 17 and 6. Yeah. You got it? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 7. That's it. Read it. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. Come on. For thou art in holy people unto the Most High thy power. Read. <clears throat> the Lord thy power hath chosen thee to be a special people. He chose Israel, the people of the Bible, to be a special people. Unto himself. Unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So when we come back to our law, statutes, and commandments, that puts us above all nations of the earth. But if they discredit the book and become the authority and try to tell you whether or not it's credible, by default, if we listen to them, they become the authority. See? We are a special people unto the Lord thy God. He has chosen us to be a special people. And to prove we're so special, no Western empire could have been built without us. Egypt became great because we were there. And I've mentioned it through countless teachings and through the academy also, that the only people that don't know how special they are, are the people. Everyone else can recognize it. So they take and, and they just drain us dry until there's no more spirit, kill us all, and then use the next generation of spiritual people with spiritual amnesia. Mm -hmm. Who's be behind this conspiracy? Before I go there, Let's go into the perilous times in, in, at the very end to prove why the Bible is so important, why the laws are so important. Because without, without the Bible, you notice no Gentile or no one out there with some level of understanding who claim they know something gives an alternative of what we should follow. Mm. Oh, no, we don't need the Bible. Just be a good person. Well, what is your interpretation of good? Mm. A rapist think raping people is good. A pedophile think, think think that's good. A homosexual think what they're doing is good. So now you need we, we, we're gonna leave we're gonna leave that to interpretation now of what's good. No, we need a law that all people can agree is right. And usually that law comes from the Bible. The Bible don't agree with lawlessness, perversions, evil, wickedness. So only the wicked would try to claim the Bible isn't true. Only the wicked. That means I know something in the Bible is against my personal behavior. Thereby, therefore, I'll just claim that it, it really is just any other book because it disagrees with my lifestyle. <laughs> That doesn't mean the Bible is wrong. You're wrong. We should have something in this earth to measure ourselves by. The Most High gave us the Bible. And because of this, because we're living in a world in which we can't substantiate anything, we, we look to the Gentiles to give anything credit or make it credible, knowing that they're evil anyway. By that, what type of world are we living in now? Let's read it. We live in perilous times. Second Timothy chapter three, verse three. Come on. <clears throat> this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers 
of their own selves. Read. Covetous. Lovers of them own, their own selves. See, if we have a law to measure ourselves by, we would love our neighbors as ourselves. See? The spirit of selfishness could not lie dormant within us because we're comparing ourselves to Christ. We're comparing ourselves uh, to those who have sacrificed themselves for a greater good. But without the law, we become lovers of ourselves. Vain. What the hell was that? Vanity. See, that, that's why the world don't want you to see the law and know the law exists. They need you vain because the Lord of this world is vain. He's vanity. Satan himself. Read. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Come on. Cover to us. Cover to us. That means not just want what they have. They want what you got. Okay. They want to take what belongs to you. That's cover to us. Read. Bolsters. The chat. Okay, good. Go ahead. Bolsters. Proud. Proud. Blasphemous. Blasphemous. Disobedient to parents. And you notice there's no honor between children and parents anymore. When the Bible says, honor thy mother and father, lest your days be short on the earth. Mm -hmm. There's no honor. You have people calling out their mother and father saying that they were never good enough and all that. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago in the academy. No one had a perfect upbringing. Okay. But our father and mother should have honor nonetheless. Why? The most high used them to bring us here. And we cannot dishonor that. The world wants us to always suck in our personal, uh, 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 I would say, you know, our personal place of darkness. Oh, my mother didn't do this right for me like other children. My father didn't do this or they wasn't there and all that. Why? Because if you don't have the spirit of dark, the, 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 if you don't have the spirit of forgiveness, you stay in that darkness. You become that child and you stay that child forever, controlled by the new world order. See, they need you as a child, always feeling someone is, has victimized you. You are a victim. You made yourself a victim. You should forgive yourself, forgive your parents and honor them. And don't put your, 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 yourself and your parents out on front street like that. Because when you put dishonor on your father's and mother's name, you know how other people are looking at you? You're dishonoring you. They're not feeling sorry for you. You're dishonoring yourself. You're dishonoring your own, your own family. Discretion fattens a house, a house. When you speak of your family, it should be honor before other people. And the things that are not so common, that stays in house. You honor. Why? Because you're putting forth a legacy for your children. You think the other nations don't have dirt and all types of evil going on amongst them? And you're going to have the nerve to laugh and joke when teachers trying to teach you? You got the nerve to, to act a fool when somebody cares about you? You talking while I'm talking? Do you know if I go to a Jewish school, them kids quiet? If I go to a white school, them kids quiet? If I go to a Latino school, they quiet? The only kids that disrespect me is black kids. That's it. My own are the only ones that disrespect me. I walk in any other school, they like, they go E.T. We taking notes. I come home. You talking, you capping jokes, you think something funny. Look how we living, ain't nothing funny. Ain't nothing funny, y'all. But what? They keep that private so that what? Their legacy. The good things can be passed down to their children. And I'm not saying excuse the bad, but we shouldn't dishonor our mother and father because our upbringing wasn't perfect. What type of upbringing you expect in captivity? 
with the, with, with the whole, with, with everyone operating against you, the healthcare system operating, trying to get to the children from birth, putting pressure on the parents to get their own children sick and all that, making it where you can't get a job and you must do certain things to just, just stay above water. What you expect? So we should have honor with our mother and father. I didn't want to go all the way there because I'm, I'm going into a more, more historical, archaeological lesson today, but I wanted to talk about that. That's the world we live in. Why? There's no law. If we dishonor our mother and father, we dishonor the God that made us. Okay? Now, I can't say that everything was perfect growing up, but guess what? I honor my mother. Who still who, who I'm blessed to still have have amongst me, and I bless and I honor my father every time I talk about my father, even though he he's passed over to my fathers. It's about the good times. Okay, I honor him in his absence. We have to take that. That's how our forefathers were before we fell. Okay, read on. <clears throat> Unthankful. We're unthankful, Reed. Unholy. Now, this is the world. Unthankful, unholy. Are, are you serious? What do you mean? Are, are those yours? Uh, are these mine? Do they belong to you? Maybe you should... Oh, my God! Thank you so much! I'm going to look at the... Okay. Just take it. Let's go! This is it? This is it! This is... This is what I was excited for? It's, it's your scooter, honey. You it's a it. scooter! Yeah, it's a scooter! I wanted a car! I have a license to drive a car! Well, it, it's, it's like a mini car. It's, it's not a mini, mini car! This fell off! Oh my god! What is that? What's a fixer upper? You're oh your my dad. god, a fixer upper? Without natural affection. Listen, and because of that, with no morality, we lose what natural affection is. We create our own affection and say, well, there's no law, so we can do what we want. Do as we will. Do as thou will. The old Alistair Crawley banter. See? You can only do this. You can only promote this type of perilous behavior in a world without the law. See? Now, is our God wrong in the scriptures for looking to banish the earth, banish this behavior from the earth? Is he insensitive? Or is this the world we want? <laughs> They're like, what God would punish people for doing? Listen. Why do you want to be evil? Why are you worried about a God punishing evil if you're doing good? <laughs> you understand? Those that are looking to do right, are, don't fear that God like, in a fearful manner. Oh, what type of God is that that will give me fire and brimstone? Well, there's no fire and brimstone for those that are following the law. Or are you just looking to be evil and hope that God excuse you for that? Go, come on, come on. Um, see, the Bible says in end times that perilous times shall come. This is, these are the times we're in. Why? We're in a time in which man can question whether or not God exists, whether or not the book is real. We're at a time where the historians and the archaeologists are Satanists and are purposely throwing people off concerning the true history that gives the Bible its true credit. And we don't expect, like I said, everyone to receive this. The kingdom is for you. But our brothers and sisters, you out there, you will have the history now to destroy anyone that comes up to you and try to claim the Bible is a myth. There's no archaeological facts concerning Moses. There's no archaeological facts concerning the laws. You will be able to sit down, hold your head up high, and defend your record. That's all we have. They took everything else from us. At least let us have our body. <laughs>
At least let us have that, right? Read perilous times. Come on. Verse 3. Without natural affection. Without natural affection. Truce breakers. Truce breakers. That means without a law because in the Bible, why? You have to honor your oaths mm. according to scriptures. You have to honor your agreements according to scriptures. But see, if you have no law, you can just break agreements. See? Just like the good old Christians that came over to America and, and broke how many uh, treaties with the North American Indians? Good old Christians. What? Oh, yeah, I'm going to kill you and uh, we're going to break this treaty. We're going to just push you into a corner somewhere and take all the good land. Forgive me, please, because I'm Jesus. See, if these were people of the law, then they could not break the law because why? They will be accountable to the punishments of it. But these people can do it. Why? The law wasn't given to them. <laughs> they can break every agreement, lie in your face, take everything from you, and, and prosper for a time. There will be a judgment, though. But they can prosper under, under, under the God of this earth. Right? Come on. False accusers. False accusers. And I'm seeing that more and more. And I think that the internet, the internet perpetuates this behavior. Why? Because people think they can type behind a computer and be blameless. They think because it's it's it's, it's sort of ambiguous, or 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 you know they can operate behind the shadows. That there is no uh, repercussion for their actions. You know how many rumors and false accusations is coming out today amongst people who claim they're following the Most High. False accusers. Why? Of people without law. Read, because the Bible says in the law, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Right? Go on. Incontinent. Incontinent. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Traitors. That means they'll be down with you for a time. And then you turn around, guess what? They say, oh, I love you. Oh, man, you help me. Next thing you know, you turn around, it's their hand. I am here. On the handle of a knife in your back. Oh, yeah, I love you. Oh, oh yeah, man. Thank you, thank you, man. Next to you, you turn around, guess, guess whose knife is in your back? Mm. Traitors. So nothing surprises me in this time. Why? Because we are living in a world that, that's been convinced, a world convinced that God don't exist, there's no law. So now you can have people who love you and you love them. And then next to you, next to you know bad. They got a knife in your back. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Check, check out this video. Ugh, <laughs> ugh. Mm. Check this video out. <laughs> they sit, they, they sit there. They, they throwing darts and then come with a knife in your back. But it's okay. The Bible says this is this is the times. Perilous times. It's okay. And when I see it, you, when I see the knife, I'm like, okay, Lord, forgive them. If Christ could forgive us, forgive them. Read. Heady. Heady. High-minded. Heady and high-minded. That means someone gets a few scriptures and a, and a, few under, a few understandings or something. They feel that, oh, I got it all. And forget the, the fundamental foundation of the law itself. Love thy neighbor as I love thyself. Read. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of the most high. See, then you make a choice. Well, I like to do this more than, a, than the law that's telling me not to. I love the feeling more than the law itself. See? Loving, read that last part again. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We love pleasure more than the Most High Himself. 
Why? Again, we're living in a time, brothers and sisters, that, that now the laws of God has been paralleled with mythology. If someone don't believe, don't want to believe the Bible, there's about a billion sites they can find online against it. Why? Because don't forget, the Most High only gave his law to a small group of people. The rest of the nations didn't receive it. So by default, all the records of religion, archaeology, and all that, it's the Gentiles boasting their history, boasting their place within the earth to be honored. So all nations, once we fell, there was no people to uphold the integrity of our, of our records. There was no people left. We couldn't defend ourselves. So they became the uh, authority of our book and claimed that they were the people and you must now follow it through their theology, their doctrine. We were tricked. See? They was leading us back to the Gentile doctrine the whole time. They just wanted you to believe that their Gentile satanic followings had something to do with the Bible. And a lot of you brothers and sisters out there, you go for it. You go for the Gentile history that discredits the Bible. That's your way of being a rebel against your Christian family. Because you found out that Christianity was wrong. But guess what? The Bible is not wrong. Christianity is wrong. You didn't have to attack the Bible. The Bible was right the whole time. I'm not going to throw out the Bible because there's some Roman Christians lying on it. So you started going into all types of things, all types of ideologies that would allow you to do drugs, to sin, to sleep with whoever you want, and all things is relative because I'm still a good person. How do you know you're good if there's nothing to measure yourself by? If there's no law, what are you measuring yourself by? If there's no Christ, where's our measuring stick? Right? What else you have? Come on, Lloyd. I see you holding something. All right, this is Romans 7 and 12. Come on. Wherefore the law is holy, and uh -huh. the commandment holy, and just, and good. It says the law is holy, the commandment's holy. Read that again. Wherefore the law is holy. And this is Paul. Mm -hmm. The law is holy. It's true. And the commandment holy. Go on. And just. And just. And good. And good. See? It's good. Because why? We have this law to measure ourselves by. How do we know what sin is without a law? How do we know we, we're failing? Mm. Go on. That's a now mm. let's go into it. I said that we are going to show you today the wilderness according to geograph geography and the Bible. All right. Now, first off, there's a conspiracy to hide this truth from you. Why? Because, brothers and sisters, this is the place we'll be again after these wars break out in the Middle East. We'll be funneled into these areas. So the Gentiles had to, con had to conspire against us and become the authority of, of history and archaeology. See? They had to move the law, of, I mean, the mountain of Moses. They had to conspire together and say, you know what? Let's make sure when these people wake up, when these children of Israel awaken from their sleep or amnesia, that they don't find or know the place that their God gave them the law, statutes, and commandments. If we tell them it's another place, 
when the archaeologi when the historians and, and the archaeologists go there and they see that it don't fit the scriptures, we can then write new records and say, well, listen, maybe the scriptures, maybe the, the Bible wasn't true. Maybe, you know, this was just some men writing and because it doesn't fit. The, the hills are not where the scriptures say they would be. The, the sea is not where the scriptures say it would be. And I'm looking at this and it doesn't fit. So the Bible must must be an inc incorrect record written by some men who just wanted to boast themselves. Right. So. Let's go to Psalms 83. And we're taking you to Mount Sinai today. Mount Sinai. Go on. The book of Psalms, chapter 83, verse 1. Keep not thou silence, O God. Go on. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult. And they that hate thee have lifted up the head. So they that hate God has lifted up their head. So there are people in this earth that hate the most high God. Why? Because they feel that that God chose his people over them. So, so they, they just cry together and say, listen, we don't like that God of Israel. Because that God has a chosen people. But if we can conspire together. We can be under a religion that accepts all people equally as God's people. See, that's Satan. That's Satan. Okay. Because common sense will tell, will tell anyone out there, common sense will tell you looking at the Bible, the Bible is an Israelite book. And that Christ is bringing back a kingdom and will rule from Israel. So even Christians without them understanding should know that the Most High has a chosen people that will be led by Christ in the kingdom. That's Israelites over all people. So that God that rule over all people equally doesn't exist. Okay? Either we're ruling or the Gentiles are ruling. That's it. No in between. And two powers cannot rule the same space at once. Okay, so when we fell, that gave the Gentiles, according to Psalms 83, an opportunity to do what? To conspire. Okay, they broke God's law. Let's make sure they stay down. Let's make sure they stay in captivity. What? We're going to make our own laws and make it okay to break the laws amongst them so that they can stay under us. And we can never tell these people that they are the children of God. They're going, to, they're going to ignore us. They're going to look down on our history and authority. They will stop listening to us. We have to tell them they're Hamites. Let them know they're anybody. If you give them back their God, we lose everything. Right? Read it. Verse 3. Come on. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, read. And consulted against thy hidden ones. They have consulted together these Gentile nations against the hidden ones. Who's hidden? Those who lost their law, statutes, and commandments through captivity. Read. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. Here's the conspiracy. They said what? Come and let us cut them off from being a nation. Let's cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. They cannot remember they're the children of Israel. So in captivity, we must teach them there's someone else. Or just don't know. Well, no one really knows who the Israelites are. They just they just disappear. Okay? While we're living the curses every day written up in Deuteronomy 28. Not only Deuteronomy 28, we, we, we live in the crypt. We live in the Lamentations of Jeremiah. We live in all of the curses of, script, of the Old Testament. What people are behind this conspiracy? Read it. Verse 5. 
For they have consulted together with one consent. One consent means one world order. Read. They are confederate against thee. And they are confederate, a government against the true children of Israel. It's a federation with a mindset and an agenda to destroy the poor people who are scattered, who are the true children of God. Go on. Verse 6. Now it's going to point out these culprits, these conspirators. Read. Verse 6. The tabernacles of Edom. The tabernacles of Edom. Edomites, who are Romans, who are Germans, who are the European powers that eventually took Asia Minor or, or Europe after Alexander the Greek. They were at first in Mount Sia, linked up with the Canaanites and married the Canaanite women and began to follow the Canaanite god, Satan. The Romans. I went into it not too long ago that the that, that the imperialistic family, the so-called Roman family over there in uh, England today. Most people think that that's Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles. No, they're from the Wetton family of Germany. And they ascended to the throne after the death of Prince Charles, the son of King James. And then they took on the names of Elizabeth. They took on the name of Charles, where they ascended from. That means they were at a lower state in Europe and ascended to something higher. What did they ascend to? Black people ruling. That's King James. King James the, the sixth and the first, right in your face. Okay. He was a Judite from the tribe of Judah. I don't care what they try to tell you. He was fighting against these Edomites from the Roman Catholic Church. Why am I mentioning this? Because the Romans before King James were, was behind the conspiracy to hide, to hide the true mountain of Horeb. The true mountain we received the laws. Guess who was behind hiding that? The Edomites. Knowing that one day it was prophesied we would one day stand in the future in that very same place before the same God. The tabernacles of who? The tabernacles of Eden. Which are the European powers, the British families. They're Edomites. They're not Japhites. And I know a lot of people say the Ashkenazi Jews, there's Ashkenaz in, in the book of uh, Genesis. No. When they went into the lands, the Japhetic lands, they took on those Japhetic names after conquering. Okay? They are Edomites that conquered under Alexander the Greek, Antiochus Epiphanes, and the Roman emperors. They're from Mount Seir. Edomites and who else? And the Ishmaelites. And the Ishmaelites. Who are the Ishmaelites? Arabs. Arabs. So they'll make you think there's this fight between the Christians and the and ISIS and the Arabs when the Saudis and the Bush families and the Queen of England are all at the pinnacle. They're, at, they're over the same conspiracy against us. That's garbage that they're fighting between Islam and Christianity. That's a lie. That's, that's a political diversion. When they're working together, a federation against us. How do we know this? Well, I've traveled all over the earth. I went into the Middle East. I've been to the West world, Western world. And guess what? They came trolling over every place together. You would think that if they were against the Christian world, then the Christian world wouldn't have no influence on, on what, what poisons are let loose over, there, over the population. They're together in, in destroying God's people. But they are together really against the children of God knowing that we are waking up. So that means the Romans, the, the Edomites, and the Arabs must work together against Israel 
So that when it comes times come, come a time in which we begin to start traveling back and forth and all that to look for these archaeological findings, these historical biblical places, it'll be someplace else. Why? Because you have the Arabs who own the land and the Romans working together to move geographical locations so that we can believe nothing happened in the Old Testament. So that we can now say, well, listen, there's no archaeological proof that it exists, so the Bible must be false. They were working together. What proof we have of that? Okay. Let's go into the St. Catherine's Monastery. Now, what is the St. Catherine Monastery, which the Catholic Church, what is that doing erected? In Egypt. Mm -hmm. One moment. Now, some of this came from the encyclopedia. We're going now into where the Gentiles who conspired against Israel, we're going to go into where they say Mount Sinai is. Now, mind you, I've been in the Middle East and they claim. Let me, let me, let me, I'm going to show you where they claim Mount Sinai is. Now, here's a picture, right? Here's the tongue of what you call the Reed Sea, right? On this side is the Gulf of Aquaba, and Arabia is over here, okay? So you got up here the Mediterranean, right? You got where we came out of Goshen and came all the way down, went round here and down here over the Gulf of Aqaba, right? But when you go down here, here's the tongue of the Red Sea. They claim that, I'm just going, this is a plain picture so you'll see this. They claim that this mount here in the middle <laughs> is in, in, in the Egyptian peninsula is where Mount Sinai is, right? They claim that the Israelites came over here and crossed here and then came around over here and went into this mountain so that you can see this, right? They say that it's in the middle, right here, right? The one, the one where that monastery is. But here's the problem. When you go to that monastery, None of the landmarks in scriptures can be found. N not one. Now you would expect if this was the Mount of the Most High, at least one landmark written of in scriptures would be there. At least one, not one. Not even the crossing nothings, nothing. Not even some of the places they went on the way, like, like the cave of Elijah, like the areas where it says where Solomon built certain things that lead that 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 that, that lead, leads directly to the Gulf of Aqaba, where we receive the law, it tells us. I'm going to show you. But when you go into this area of this mountainous area, nothing, zero. So what happens if if a historian goes there and say, you know what, I'm going to prove the Bible right? And they go to the Egyptian peninsula and go to this mountain. They'll come back what? They'll come back confused, believing the, the, the Bible is not true. And what? They lied. So they had to move the geographical location, knowing that people, the majority of people, don't have the time to really go into the research themselves. So now these alternative archaeologists who claim they went to the Middle East and all that, they're going to bring back proof to us in captivity. We trust them as archaeologists and historians. And what are they going to bring back? The whole Bible is a lie. I've been there. I've been to the mount where they claim the, where they claim the law was given. And guess what? None of what the Bible says is there. Why would the Egyptians want to do this? Why would the Romans want to do this? <laughs> Right? They're conspiring against us, like the scripture said. Now, I want you to read this here. 
Who did this? Who moved Mount Sinai? <clears throat> Read it. The oldest. Start. start. Let's go. Uh, it says here, the oldest record of monastic life at Sinai comes from the travel journal written in Latin by a woman named Egeria, about 381 to 384. Between 381 and 384. Now, mind you, this is right after Constantine and the pagans integrated paganism with Christianity. They did this around 325, three, between 321 and 325 A.D., right? Read. She visited many places around the Holy Land and Mount Sinai, where, according to the Hebrew Bible, Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. According to the Hebrew Bible, you see, they made a distinction there. Moses received the commandments of God, right? Now, here's a person who's not a Hebrew, who's not an Israelite, who's given an outside perspective of what she thinks. Now, the law wasn't given to her, right? But go on. It says the monastery was built by order of Emperor Justinian I. Go ahead. Reigned 527 to 565. Around the 6th century, read. Enclosing the chapel of the burning bush, also known as St. Helen's Chapel. St. Helen's Chapel is placed in this very place where there is no archaeological proof that Moses or the Israelites were there. It's a high mountain. It's a beautiful view. But none of what the Bible says is there. Go on. Ordered to be built by Empress Consort Helena, mother of Constantine the Great. So she ordered a church be there. Be placed there on this new Mount Sinai by who? Constantine what? the Great. Constantine was an Edomite, a Roman, who integrated paganism to hijack Christianity. Okay, who made Sunday worship, who made now Christmas and Easter to be followed opposed to the Most High's holy days. See, read. At the site where Moses is supposed to have seen the burning bush. Go on. The living bush on the grounds is purportedly the one seen by Moses. Structurally, the monastery's king post trust is the oldest known surviving roof trust in the world. The, the site is sacred to Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Hold up. It's sacred to Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Hold up. The same people that the Most High said would conspire against us in captivity. Right? Go on. A mosque was created by converting an existing chapel during the Fatimid Caliphate. 909 to 1171. So later on, during the times near the Crusades, the so-called Muslims erected a mosque in the same area. So when the Bible says that the conspirators are Edom and Ishmael, now they want us to go to that mountain to worship what? Their religions, to give total credibility to a lesser understanding of God that automatically relegates us under their power and religion, right? So we go to see where the Most High gave us our law, and we run into a mosque. We run into a Roman Catholic church, and then none of the historical artifacts written up in scriptures can be found. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about things they can pick up and, and take for themselves. I'm talking about landmarks, geographical locations where the whole earth must be moved if it's not there. It's as if they took the whole Mount Sinai up and placed it somewhere else. Right? <laughs> Go down here, Elder Lord, where it says uh, the monasteries, St. Catherine's Monastery. It says here, the monastery, along with several dependencies in the area, constitute the, constitute the entire church of Sinai. So it's is, an entire church of Sinai, read. Really? Which is headed by an archbishop who is also the abbot of the monastery. The exact administrative status of the church within the Eastern Orthodox Church is ambiguous by some, including the church itself. It is considered 
or auto followers by others an autonomous church under the jurisdiction of the Greek Orthodox Church of Jerusalem the Greek Orthodox Church of Jerusalem so here it is you got the Muslims Arabs you have the Romans Christian Church and you have the Danite Greek Orthodox all together conspiring to have people go there and worship a lesser God right so what happens when a true historian and archaeologist come to that area who are not dealing with no religions right they'll go there and they'll look at this and say you know what i'm just going to deal with it from an, an anthropology uh, anthropy or a a, a, a uh, an archaeological standpoint i'm not even going to deal with the religious aspect i know you all have your little beliefs but i'm going to deal with it strictly through science now right he goes there and with the bible and say you know what this all of this is a joke all of you are just getting paid off of a lie. <laughs> Why is it still doing it? One moment. All right. Right. So he goes back and say, all of you, our religion is wrong. Mm -hmm. You should get paid. Y'all made a map so that y'all can pay people for tourist reasons. Y'all done set up a tour tourist attraction getting paid off of off of these uh, impressionable God believers. Atheists are having a field day with this. OK. So it works, it, it, you know, it's a win-win for Satan. All right? Mm -hmm. It's a win-win for him. Because if you don't believe, he got you anyway. Right. <laughs> if you do believe, you believe a lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? So how can we prove them wrong? First of all, let's not use them. Where do the scriptures say Mount Sinai is within the earth? Let's go to the book of Galatians. Come on. Here we go now. Here we go. This is the place I've been, this is what I've been waiting for. Now, I'm going to give you a, here's a physical picture of what, where they claim Mount Sinai is. See? Down here. So that means there was no real crossing of the sea down there. Now, Saudi Arabia, you have Egypt on this side, right? You know how people came from Egypt, came down from Goshen, and went around, right? Went around, went down to here. But here's the problem. The land of Midian is over here where Moses was in Arabia. The land of Midian is here where the mount was. So they, they just put something in the middle to, to agree for a tourist site. See that? But when Saudi Arabia, the land of Midian is right here. So they're on the wrong side, buddy. They're on the wrong side of the sea. Here's the Gulf of Aquaba right here. The Gulf of Aquaba is right here. Where Midian is. Here's the Gulf of Aquaba. Right there. So they're on the wrong side. They, they made sure that they kept you within Egypt's border so that Egypt can have control over that tourist site. See that? Lied. They lied. So, where does the Bible tell us Mount Sinai is? And is there any archaeological proof standing today? Huh? 
Let's go. Galatians 4. The book of Galatians chapter 4, verse 22. Galatians 4 and 22. For it is written, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. Go on. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But it's speaking he, of Hagar, go on. And Hagar, which was an Egyptian woman, is the mother of the Arabs, of the Ishmaelites, who, 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 who has conspired against us. Read. But he of the free woman was by promise. Come on. Verse 24. Which things are in allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth bondage. Hold up. Mount Sinai, which what? Which gendereth, gendereth to bondage. Which gendereth to bondage. Which is Hagar. Which is Hagar. Read. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai. My, Mount Sinai. What geographical location? In Arabia. Hold up. Mount Sinai in Arabia. So when Moses went into Midian, okay, after being extradited out of Egypt for 40 years, he eventually went into Midian and married amongst Jethro. It was in Arabia. That's where the mount was. In Arabia, where Midian is. So it wasn't on this side, the deception of the of Islam and Christianity. It was over here. Right? Check this out. Follow me here. Now, when you go to Arabia, now this is an actual satellite image. Of the exodus right so it shows the exodus it shows us going from here all the way down over here up here then crossing into Arabia right right there crossing into Arabia Now, we're going to make a page on our website, GatheringOfChrist.org, GatheringOfChrist.org, that breaks down this whole thing, right? This is where we crossed, right here, the crossing. Into what? Arabia. Now, check this out. When you go to Arabia... To take a gander or a glance of this archaeological biblical jewel, this finding, what happens? In Arabia, they have preserved it and they have a gate in front of it. Hold up. They have a, oh, where's it at? They have a gate in front of it. The gate is around an altar that was built according to scriptures without hewn rock like it says us going into the wilderness and make sure we don't hewn the rock for the altar that's in arabia hold up the egyptians <laughs> the egyptians don't have authority on this side of the gulf of aqua hold up now there's a sign in arabia where that gate is out of the lawyer, I want you to read that sign. It says, archaeological area. An archaeological area. Warning. Warning. It is unlawful to trespass. It is unlawful to trespass. Violators are subject to penalties. Violators are subject to penalties. Stipulated on the antiquities regulation. Hold up. So there's an antiquity. Antiquity. Historical place gated, protected by Saudi Arabia that none can touch. While they make you believe the mount is someplace else. So the place that you can go to, they'll let you just go there for free and just go around and just look around and take pictures, do whatever you would like. 
Why? Because they know that's not the place. They want the historians and archaeologists and those to go to go to the place they set up as a diversion. Because they know that's the news you're going to take back to the Western world and the ignorant to discredit the book. But when you go over to where the Bible says the true mount is, what happens? What happens? They have it gated. Now, some people ask, well, if it's in Arabia and the Ishmaelites were behind it, the conspiracy, why didn't they just tear this place down and deal with it all together and go against it? You think they didn't try? They go into certain areas here. The most high will deal with them and have dealt with them. Okay? I know a lot know a lot of you look at movies and all that and, and think that some of this thing things that things are fake. Marion, don't look at it. Shut your eyes, Marion. Don't look at it no matter what happens. showed you Raiders of the Lost Ark when they went into areas they had no business and what happened they met they ran into spiritual intervention and that's why they cannot touch this area Jabal Allah Jabal Musa Bob and Larry get their first look at the mysterious peak could this be the holy mountain of God spoken of in the Old Testament? Jabal Musa, which I knew clearly was Arabic for the mountain of Moses. He clearly knew this there as Moses' mountain. It's such an interesting mountain. When you see Jabal al Allah from a distance, you think that my first impression was uh, there must be a cloud up there, there's a shadow over it, because the corner of the top, kind of a triangular part, black. We know the Bible says that God descended on the mountain in flames of a furnace. So for me, it was a, kind of a surreal moment. As they move closer to the mountain, they are confronted with a harsh reality. Warning signs posted in both Arabic and English and impenetrable high barbed wire fences surrounding the base of the mountain. Aware now of the fact that they could be spotted at any moment, the two move ahead cautiously, looking for any evidence they can find. What they find next will leave them breathless. I'm looking for markings and paintings and little etchings around the mountain, and I kind of walked upon it. Come on over here, come on over here. I'm looking for a little something a little like this. And I looked up and I saw this huge rock monolith. This is actual video footage of their remarkable find, smuggled out of Saudi Arabia at great risk. Well, the altar is obviously man-made. It's immense. It would have taken hundreds of men or thousands of men to erect. 
And so this wasn't a band of nomads that erected this. And this altar site is out in the middle of a huge, flat, arid field. There's no rocks close to it at all. I mean, it's, it stands all by itself, right, Bob? There's, there's nothing close to it. So the rocks didn't just grow there. They came from some place. Bob and Larry move in closer to examine mysterious petroglyphs on the side of the altar, instantly recognizing their similarity to the ancient Egyptian deities Apis and Hathor. I figured that if, if this was Mount Sinai, this had to be the altar where they made the golden calf. Why would you put a fence around a random rock pile? They wouldn't. They know that this has great importance. And they've erected a fence with barbed wire to keep people away. It's being preserved. That area is being preserved. And when the Gentiles look to touch it, the angels deal with them. So they put a gate around it and say, listen, no trespassing. <laughs> right? Now, how do we know that this place at the Gulf of Aquaba is the place? This is the Gulf of Aquaba right here. Well, the Bible says it's in Arabia. That's the Gulf of Aquaba on this side. Right? Right there. That's the Gulf of Aquaba right here. How do we know it's on this side and not here? Number one, the scriptures tells us it's in Arabia. That excludes Egypt. That's number one, right? But there's other landmarks that cannot be disputed. When you go into this place called Jebel al-Laws, the mountain of laws, there's 12 pillars for each of the tribes of Israel. From high atop the mountain, Jim and Penny see the V-shaped altar of sacrifice. The altar of sacrifice is what inspired us to continue to go back to the mountain. This is where the pillars are. And what are they doing there? These huge stone pillars. Again, civilization would have been required to construct these. It says in chapter 24 of Exodus that Moses got up early, he erected 12 pillars, he built an altar there at the base of the mountain and then he brings oxen in for sacrifice. Recent excavations show evidence of ancient ash deep in the soil at this site. The 12 pillars were signifying the 12 tribes of Israel. What would we have for pillars? We found these white stone pillars, about 22, 24 inches in diameter. They're kind of a white, soft, marble-ish type material. They would have stacked right on top of one another. Uh, ancient Egyptian photographs show that this is a style of building a, a pillar type formation. Now we don't know it's an altar. It, it, it's a rock formation, whatever it is, but I mean, what is it doing there? And, and why 12 pillars? And, and why not 9? Why not 14? Why 12? The Bible says it was of uncut stone and no steps. I mean, the precision of, of Scripture in here is amazing because it calls out that this altar is located right at the foot of the mountain. And sure enough, there it sat. I'm going to go through a few of them here. Let's go through a few of them, Elder Lloyd. Yes, sir. Let's go to Exodus 3 and 1. Now it's time to hit that Bible now. How do we know where the mount is? Book of Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Hold up, even to Horeb, right? Read it again. Come now on. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. Go it on. came to the mountain of God, even the mountain of Horeb. Even the mountain of Horeb. So guess what? Not too far from the wilderness, guess what the, the archaeologists found? Guess what they found? They found the burial or the sepulchre of Jethro. Mm. Where did they find it? In Arabia. 
There's a place called the grave of or the sepulchre of Jethro in Arabia. Where is that? Midian, the land of Midian on this side of the Gulf. So here's a lie right here. There's no crossing right there. Right? Follow me here. Read that once more, Elder Lloyd. This is the book of Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Come on. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. So the lamb was on the backside of the desert. So when you look at where the Gulf of Aqaba is, the water, then the desert would be inward, this way. So that's where the mountain is. I got more proof, right? Let's deal with the crossing, where the Israelites crossed the Reed Sea. Which is, which is connected to what? The Gulf of Aquaba. Let's go to 1 Kings. Read 1 Kings 9 and 26. 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 26. Come on. Then King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezion Gebed, which is beside Elah, on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Eden. Go on. And Hiram sent to the sent in the navy his servants, shipmen that had the knowledge of the sea, with the servants of Solomon. And they came to Ophir and fetched from thence gold 420 talents and brought it to King Solomon. When it says here, first Kings 9 and 26, and it says on the shore of the Red Sea, mm -hmm. it says right here, this verse provides us with some compelling clues of the area, right? Mm -hmm. Look at what it says here. It refers to a body of water through which the Israelites passed at the time of the Exodus. It can also be read, however, Yam Sa, Sea Lands In, a more likely reading referring to the Red Sea and to its eastern arm, the Gulf of Aquaba. What's the Gulf of Aquaba? Right here. So you have the land of Edom up here, then you went down to the Gulf of Aquaba. So what, what? It would be between the Red Sea and up here. So it's not up Petra, it's not at the tongue of the Red Sea, it's right here in the middle going into Arabia. A geographical location of where Solomon sent ships, which is the same area our people were at the mount. Are you following me here? Listen to this clearly. More. Let's go to where the Most High came down and rained fire on the mountain. He came down with fire on the mount. Let's go there real quick. Right? Let's go to Exodus. Exodus 19, verse 18. I'll start at 16. Exodus 19, 16 on down to 23. We give you a geographical location of where the wilderness is. Where the Mount of the Most High is. Where we receive the laws at. That's now being controlled on the... Uh, uh, the Saudi side, or in Arabia, till this day, untouched, unscathed, being protected. Right? You ready? Yes, sir. Come on, chapter and verse. Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. Come on. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning, 
Yes. That there were thunders and lightnings. There were thunders and lightnings. And a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. Come on. So that all the people that was in it, or that was in the camp, trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with the Most High Ahiah. Come on. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke. It was all together on a what? On a smoke. On a smoke. Because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And fire. And the smoke thereof ascended, ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And, and the whole mount quaked greatly. See, that's the problem with the Mount Sinai in the Egyptian peninsula. It's not charred. There's no fire or, or mountain showing that it, that smoke or fire came down. But guess what? When you look at a picture from the Arabian side, the Gulf of Aqaba in Arabia, there's a mount that's burnt at the top. The significance is finding anything Egyptian in Saudi Arabia. And on top of that, no archaeologist ever has found a scintilla or a trace of anything at St. Catherine's. Nothing's been found there. Yet in Saudi Arabia, we find something doesn't belong there. Egyptian artifacts in Saudi Arabia. The top of Sinai is very black, darkened rock. It has a uh, appearance of, in, in some light, coal. It's extremely interesting because the closer you get up toward the blackened peak, you can see where the red granite folds down and the black begins. And it's a dividing line that is like night and day. In some light, it actually has a blue tinge to it. And one of the verses in scripture talks about the top of the mountain as if it were a sapphire stone. Especially toward noonday, it gets a shiny patina on it to where it looks like you're walking around on obsidian. It is literally that shiny and that black. Basically, there are three different kinds of rocks. These are igneous rocks, those that are formed from volcanic activity, then there are sedimentary rocks which are formed under the oceans, under the lakes, and in riverbeds, and so on. And then there's a third variety called metamorphic rocks. And metamorphic rocks are those that are recrystallized under temperature and pressure conditions. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, uh, when I looked at the thin section, it told me that it is a metamorphic rock. When you stand there, and you look all the way around you, there are convoluted mountain ranges going off in every direction, and there are none that are the color of the one you're standing on. It is black, and every bit of the rest of it is a red, burnished, brownish granite, as far as the eye can see. So the gate is protecting that land so that they can't get to this mountain. Neither do they want to go to this mountain. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is archaeological proof that the Bible is true concerning this event. What caused this mount to be charred? What's the difference between this mount and the other ones around there? And guess where this mount is? It's Mount Horeb in Arabia. Oh, you think... Here it is. It was one. We looked in the, in the peninsula of Egypt, couldn't find one thing, right? We didn't found a few things so far, right? So, how many of you, so called archaeologists or atheists who claim that the Bible is, is, is fallacy, how many of you are willing to go and check this out? 
or, or are you satisfied with the lie? Oh, oh, there's more. There is more. There is more. Come on, stick with me here. Go to Exodus 32 and 4. And he perceived them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. After he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Okay. And guess what? Wait, where's this my uh, notes here? Oh, here it is. The altar that they built around, where they had the golden calf at, not too far from here, guess what they got engraved on the side of the rock? They got a golden calf. They got a calf engraved on the side of these rocks that says Yahweh. As they move closer to the mountain, they are confronted with a harsh reality. Warning signs posted in both Arabic and English and impenetrable high barbed wire fences surrounding the base of the mountain. Aware now of the fact that they could be spotted at any moment, the two move ahead cautiously, looking for any evidence they can find. What they find next will leave them breathless. I'm looking for markings and paintings and little etchings around the mountain, and I kind of walked upon it. Come on over here, come on over here. I'm looking for a little something a little like this. And I looked up and I saw this huge rock monolith. This is actual video footage of their remarkable find, smuggled out of Saudi Arabia at great risk. Well, the altar is obviously man-made. It's immense. It would have taken hundreds of men or thousands of men to erect. And so this wasn't a band of nomads that erected this. And this altar site is out in the middle of a huge, flat, arid field. There's no rocks close to it at all. I mean, it's, it stands all by itself, right, Bob? There's, there's nothing close to it. So the rocks didn't just grow there. They came from some place. Bob and Larry move in closer to examine mysterious petroglyphs on the side of the altar instantly recognizing their similarity to the ancient Egyptian deities Apis and Hathor. I figured that if, if this was Mount Sinai, this had to be the altar where they made the golden calf. Why would you put a fence around a random rock pile? They wouldn't. They know that this has great importance. And they've erected a fence with barbed wire to keep people away. And there's another pillar that says Edom Yahweh in the same area in Arabia. Showing you that's the God Edomites will worship. Hold up now. Go to Exodus 24 and 4. Exodus chapter 24, verse 4. Come on. And Moses wrote all the words of the Most High. And Moses wrote all the words of the Most High. Come on. And rose up early in the morning and built it an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel was built by Moses. Guess what's on the side of Arabia behind this gate? From high atop the mountain, Jim and Penny see the V-shaped altar of sacrifice. The altar of sacrifice is what inspired us to continue to go back to the mountain. This is where the pillars are. And what are they doing there? These huge stone pillars. Again, civilization would have been required to construct these. It says in chapter 24 of Exodus that Moses got up early, he erected 12 pillars, he built an altar there at the base of the mountain, and then he brings oxen in for sacrifice. Recent excavations show evidence of ancient ash deep in the soil at this site. The 12 pillars were signifying the 12 tribes of Israel. What would we have for pillars? We found these white stone pillars about 22, 24 inches in diameter. They're kind of a white, soft, marble-ish type material. They would have stacked right on top of one another. Uh, ancient Egyptian photographs show that this is a style of building, a, a pillar type formation. Now we don't know it's an altar. It, it, it's a rock formation, whatever it is, but I mean, what is it doing there? 
And, and why 12 pillars? And, and why not nine? Why not 14? Why 12? The Bible says it was of uncut stone and no steps. I mean, the precision of, of Scripture in here is amazing because it calls out that this altar is located right at the foot of the mountain. And sure enough, there it sat. Twelve separate pillars in Arabia. The same exact description we're reading in the Bible right now. That's what's behind that gate. And they make it, if you want to travel there, you must have some level of, of, of high prestige and a clearance. And you can only stay in the area with someone guiding you, only in the places they can allow you to be. And you have to leave after 24 days <laughs> under their law. Why? I haven't looked into all that yet. But I know that when it all breaks down and what happens over the Middle East, I know that gate is going to fall mm -hmm. and our people are going to be in that same area. OK, we have to be gathered in the areas outside of there. But persecution is going to lead us. The Most High is going to allow us to go back again and we will be protected in that same area. More. Now, you can't dispute this. One. Let's go to Exodus 17 and 6. The book of Exodus chapter 17, verse 6. Come on. Behold, I will stand before thee. I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. Now, Moses, because our Israelites, our people complaining, hungry, thirsty, Moses says, you know what? I'll stand before the rock of Horeb and do what? And thou shalt smite the rock and there shall come water out that the people may drink. And there shall come water out that the people shall drink. Brothers and sisters, here's the rock of Horeb that was split by the staff of Moses. In Arabia. Right in the same area of the 12 pillars, in the same area of, of Midian. Here it is. I think the greatest find around this mountain was the split rock discovery. We had nothing to do with the split rock discovery. It was brought to our attention by the Caldwell family. This to me is the real nail in this whole thing that drives it home that this is the real Mount Sinai. And we came up to a break in the rocks and I looked over from the north looking due south and both of us were just stunned. There two miles away was a monolith that just stood out in the landscape. In that valley there are numerous natural outcroppings of hills that are just comprised of boulders and then there is this one with this massive rock sitting atop of it. From a distance it's big. When you're close to it, it is enormous. It's four stories tall. And I've often said that the miracle that would have happened there probably rivaled or surpassed the crossing of the Red Sea. The Exodus account says that the people of Israel grumbled against Moses saying, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Your tongue feels like a piece of tar from a Texas highway when you're out in the desert. The sun is relentless. They would have cried out for water. And of course Moses heard their cries, petitioned God. Moses struck the rock and it split right down the middle from top to bottom. The Bible literally says the water gushed from this. I climbed up the backside to the very base of this rock and right at the base of that split it's deeply gouged and the rock on either side if you look straight up from the inside of that rock it's really really smooth but it's pressure flaked big chunks of granite have been flaked from the bottom and it, it, it's not a normal erosive pattern for granite granite generally from just wind and erosion will crack 
and flake off from the top down. This is coming up as though something came flying up and really gouged the rock. When that rock was split in two, a geyser erupted out of the top of it. It blew those two pieces of that rock apart. It's very interesting. This part of the world gets a half an inch of rain every 10 years. And it's so arid and so dry. Yet this rock shows distinct evidence of water erosion. Not just a trickle, a burst of water flowing from it, washing out the whole mountainside, going down and washing all the sand that's down below it, creating a, an ancient lake bed down below. Now you're talking about anywhere from 600,000 estimates of up to 2 million people that came out of Egypt. If we were talking about a tiny little rock with a tiny little trickle, they would still be in line waiting to get a sip of that water. This place would have filled with water so quickly that that entire group of people could have come around the edges of this two or three mile long area and immediately taken their fill of water. It's very compelling. If you were to show the picture to somebody and say, well, it came from Colorado or Utah, well, you'd accept that. But if you say this came from one of the most arid places in the world where there are no rivers. The most graphic description would be found in Psalms. Thou didst cleave the rock in the wilderness and the waters ran down as rivers. And that Hebrew word for clave means to split cleanly in two. There is no such candidate for any other site that has been investigated or is currently being investigated as Mount Sinai. He struck, he, he struck the rock with his staff and it split it down and water gushed out like a river coming out of it, like a faucet for the people. And guess what? Enough water to nourish all 12 tribes came out of this rock. This ain't no small little rock here. I think this stands about 22 feet. And he struck it in the power of the Most High split the rock like fire and opened up and water came out of it. And guess what? Archaeologists did do testing on this. And it was weird how they have water crystals dried up in a desert on this rock. <laughs> how is that possible? In the midst of a desert. It's showing water ran out of this rock, according to modern day archaeologists, and they can't explain how, how it happened. It defies physics. It defies anything that we, that any technology or understanding of how things operate in our three-dimensional world. But it's proof that water ran off of this rock in Arabia, not too far from the Gulf of Aqaba in Midian. Here's the lie. The lie is it was never there. The Roman Catholic Church and the Arabs placed and put together a false Sinai to discredit the book. So that now Sinai or what they call their mouth can be controlled by the who? The Egyptians. You have Sharmai Sheikh down here at the tongue of this. You have the Gulf of Aqaba over here. And you have the land of Midian where Moses fled on this side. This is where we really crossed over. Where the Most High sent the winds, moved the water so that Israel, our forefather, can walk over on dry shod. A lie right here. By the Egyptians, the Arabs, and the Christian Romans. They're liars. The real biblical site of the Exodus is New Wyba, Egypt, and it's going to show you just in a second in the actual route, uh, which is uh, the Red Sea on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba. And it goes on to say that the wilderness has them entangled in actual pictures when traveling through the wilderness of the Red Sea. Uh, it, it talks about this in Exodus chapter 13 and 14. But when you go to the beach where the crossing took place, we're in New Wyba, Egypt.
And of course it says, uh, Egyptian military fortress probably Migdol blocked any northern escape route along the beach. Uh, and it says, additionally, there were mountains obstructing their escape. To the south, the mountains came down to the sea, as mentioned by Josephus, for there was on each side a ridge of mountains that terminated at the sea, which were impassable by reason of their roughness and obstructed their flight. And this is according to the antiquities of the Jews. Uh, and you can see the mountains at the beach today. The people were about to turn against Moses because he had led them to an area where they were trapped and would surely die, or so they thought. And of course, this is the New Iba Beach then this is the actual crossing of the Exodus. And we can see, you'll see the column, you'll see the uh, chariot wheels that are underwater in this area. I'm telling you, it's all here. Now, this is the granite column of Solomon. And it says this column matches one on the other side of the Gulf of in Saudi Arabia, which had the inscriptions intact. The Hebrew words Mitzrayim, which means Egypt, death, water, Pharaoh, Edom, Yahuwah, and Solomon were on that column. So what does that tell you? And it's New Waiba, Egypt. That's where this is, that's where the column is found. And here's the column right here, which marks the crossing site. And in case you don't know, you'll find one of the columns on one side of New Waiba, Egypt, as well as on the Saudi Arabia side, on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba. But it says, King Solomon had these columns erected 400 years after the miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea on dry land. Solomon's seaport was at the northern tip of the Gulf of Aqaba at Elat, for according to First Kings chapter nine, and he was very familiar with the Red Sea crossing site as it was in his neighborhood. The Bible even mentions this column in Isaiah chapter nineteen, verses nineteen, where it says, "And that day there will be an altar to Yahuwah in the midst of the land of Mitzrayim or Egypt, and a pillar to Yahuwah at its border." Wow, that's exactly right there. Interesting. You can visit the beach today and see the column in person, as as this research was able to do in October two thousand and five, and you can. Actually actually see it on Google Images as well. They show you right there. But it's what's also interesting is the name New Waiba. Like I said, this name right here, New Waiba, Egypt, is short for what? It's short for this name right here, New Waiba al Muzayina, which means it means the waters of Moses opening. This is amazing. And the exact spot where the crossing took place, we have the site confirmed by maps because that's the crossing route. This is New Iba, Egypt. This is the Gulf of Aqaba. And this is the side of Saudi Arabia, uh, as you can see on a map. Uh, and you can keep going on with the pictures, the view at Red Sea. But what I want to really focus your attention to as well is the chariot wheels that were found in the sea at New Waiba. Is that a coincidence? They even took pictures and found actual chariot wheels above chariot wheels fixed to axles standing at attention on this seabed. You can see them right here. You can see one right here as well and another right there. Above left photo taken of a gilded chariot wheel that remains on the seafloor. It was found by Ron Wyatt using a molecular frequency generated from his boat above after he set the equipment to search for gold. The Bible said all the chariots of Egypt and 600 choice chariots of gold veneered models were in the army pursuing Yahuwah Elohim's people. It is speculated there were 20,000 chariots destroyed that day. Above right is a drawing of a four-spoke chariot found in an Egyptian tomb from the same time period. Four, six, and eight spoke wheels are found here in the Gulf and were only used at the same time during the 18th, well, actually the 13th dynasty or 1446 BC when the Exodus took place. But do they want you to know that? Why are they hiding this from you should be the question. In the spring of 2000, a robotic camera was lowered into these waters for the first time. This has never been done. No one has been in the area at all with a remote control camera. The robotic camera's survey revealed many shapes and objects familiar to Moeller, including coral formations with right angles, arches, discs, and straight shafts fused into larger masses that had the appearance of twisted wreckage. Now, when we have been able to go back and forth with a remote control camera, we can repeatedly see that these strange structures we are looking for are there, not at one place, but you see them again and again and again. There are situations where you see something that looks like an axle, a hub, something that looks like a wheel, 
and you say to yourself, this is not a coral reef, this is a coral growth on an artifact. And that is what's different to me when I compare corals at other locations around the world. Since the earliest explorations at Nueva, one distinctive type of formation has often been identified on the sea floor. A slender, table-like structure, sometimes standing on end, with a coral-encrusted base, a straight shaft, and a circular top. It's a 90 degree angle, a right angle, between something that looks like an axle and the wheel. And you can see this in different varieties and it looks very different from normal coral growth. And uh, it is like a man-made structure with a coral growth on it. In the midst of them, Pan Tien photographed this circular object attached to what appears to have been a broken axle or hub. This discovery was significant for two reasons. Pan Tien had documented the coral encrusted form of a wheel with dimensions similar to ancient Egyptian artifacts directly across from the proposed Nueva crossing site. Her find also provided independent confirmation of earlier evidence establishing wheel-like formations on both coasts of the Red Sea in accordance with descriptions in the biblical record. And the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army, and he made the wheels of their chariots come off. One more thing, Exodus 15 and 27. Exodus chapter 15, verse 27. Start at 22. Verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And, there, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Morah, they could not drink of the waters of Morah, for they were bitter, therefore the name of it was called Morah. And I'm glad we pointed that out, because when you look at that landmark Morah, you would never guess where that is. The side of Saudi Arabia. I'm giving you all these landmarks. So you can look at it, look, look it up yourself and, and see the lies that came from the Romans and the Arabs. Why? They conspired against us. They upset that a promise is coming back with Christ to free us. They've deceived us. They have moved the whole mountain and lied through science and archaeology and false history. And our people just eat it up. When you go into that, it shows here. Ex read this real, real quick. Exploring the further, further possibility. Read. Yes, sir. It says, uh, Bitter Springs of Morah. Exploring the further possibility that the Israelites passed through the waters of the Red Sea at the Strait of Tehran. We pick up our search for landmarks on the Saudi Arabia side of the Gulf of Aqaba. Go on. Then we started at the coastline on the eastern side of the Strait of Tehran and traveled the, the most natural route approximately 30 kilometers inland to a group of springs where the water in some of the springs was terribly bitter. So archaeologists went the same route as those in the scriptures and tasted the water. And guess what? Today. It's bitter. You can't drink it. Mm. <laughs> In Saudi Arabia. But why these archaeologists that have put some of this together, why don't they get a platform? Why no one is listening to them? <laughs> okay. Mm. On and on and on and on and on. We know exactly where the wilderness is. Another thing, where Elijah went in a cave. I'm gonna get that real quick. One moment. First Kings 19, 8 and 9. First Kings chapter 19, verse 8. And he arose and did eat and drink and went 
in the strength of that meat, forty days and forty nights, unto Horeb, the mount of God. So even Elijah went to Horeb, the mount of God, right, Read. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto or came to him. Now, why are we mentioning this? This is way after the law, statutes, and commandments. You would never guess where they found Elijah's cave. If this is the true Mount Sinai. Well, Mount Sinai and Horeb are synonymous. They mean the same thing in scripture. And to be the real Mount Sinai, you need to have a cave on that mountain. The Bible specifically talks about a cave on the mountain that Elijah visited with a cloak over his face and he looked out at the valley below, the Bible says. Looking across from their position, they spot what appears to be the opening of a large cave. Though unable to reach it, Cornuke and Williams clearly know its significance. When you go to St. Catherine, there's no cave there. He said, where did Elijah go? He wanted to manufacture and put a cave that fits with what the Bible says you could do. <laughs> Near the Mount of War. So the Christian churches ran by the, the, the demonic Romans and the the Arabs under Islam already together at the top of this pyramid, making you think there's a fight between each other when they're conspiring against the children of God who are scattered between both religions. The Bible says a curse on Israel that they would serve both wood and stone. The wood is your cross and the stone is your rock in Islam. The wood is the cross in Christianity. The stone is the rock in Islam. They both work together to put a monastery and a mosque in a fake area and call it Mount Sinai to discredit the book. By default, will fall prey to their demonic and evil religions and deception against our people. All right? Let's get a few more. What did I tell you to go here? Uh, First Kings 10, 13. Go ahead. There's another one in Chronicles. And Second Chronicles 9 and 14. Uh, First Kings chapter 10, verse 15. Dylan Moore, these are scriptures given you about the, the Midian Arabian area. It says, beside that, he had of the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governors of the country. So this is just going into our commerce back and forth in scriptures with the Arabians, giving you geographical locations, even in your Bible map uh, concerning these, uh, these negotiations and contracts and, and goings back and forth. We had a regular connection even after Jethro with Arabia. That's why uh, when Elijah went to operate, he went into the same area. Why? The Most High's mouth was there. It wasn't deep in Arabia. It's between the Gulf of Aqaba inland. So that land of Midian is where the Mount of the Most High is. And we will be there again. And he's going to protect us like a fire round about the same way he did Elijah. Let's go there real quick. Which shows the most time will be a fire round about. Let me get that. Uh, Zechariah 2. Come on. Uh, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 1. I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. A man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. And he said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls, for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I say, if the Lord will be unto her, a wall of fire round about her. See that? When it says Jerusalem is speaking of the people because Jerusalem has been destroyed. So it's telling us that what? Read that again. For I say the most time will be unto her a wall of fire round about her. A wall of fire round about her. Read. 
and will be the glory in the midst of her and will be the glory in the midst of her mm -hmm. so what's going to happen the areas that the scriptures say in Isaiah 11 and 11 that's where we'll be until the high persecutions from the quote unquote new world order that's after the fall of Babylon then the most high says he's gonna he's gonna smite the water seven streams we're going to go over into a land and be protected for a time with the most high round about us. So that gate is going to be gone. It's going to be the most high protecting us. Then it tell you in Ezekiel, the nations are going to think something against us and say, let's go against them in towns without walls. And that will be the beginning of the end of the new world, the, the new world's armies, according to scriptures. That will lead to the coming of Christ. But again, I said I wanted to bring out some proof today because that's a whole lesson in itself that I will cover soon. But I wanted to go into a geographical area to show you that there is a place that no one can touch that's still in existence right now, which is the Mount of the Most High. Mount Horeb is in Arabia, according to scriptures. And it's being protected by the angels. That's why the government of Arabia can't deal with it or touch it. They can put a gate around it, but they can't touch it. It's being preserved for those that run into that area from the persecution. Let's end it with Galatians. And we'll go into the lesson we prepared today next week. I wanted to show that today. Read it. The book of Galatians, chapter 4, verse 24. Come on. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. These are the two covenants, read. The we know that one covenant was with Ishmael, and the other was with our father, Isaac. And see, this is another reason why Arabs would like to discredit Paul. Because Paul was attacking the Ishmaelite imposition against our people. He was making it straight with those Arabs that they are not the, the people. They are not the authority, even though they were born before us under Hagar. Go on. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage. Which gendereth unto bondage, read. Which is Hagar. Which is Hagar, which is the Egyptian woman who married our father Abram and brought forth who? Ishmael, the handmaid who brought forth Ishmael was an Egyptian, a Hamite. Read. 25. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in where? In Arabia. In Arabia, showing us her children would be Arabs. And that land that they would rule or operate over would be the land called Arabia today. See that? That was the promise or the, or the blessing Abram gave his son Ishmael. That's the land mass that was promised to them. That's also what borders that area is the Mount of the Most High. Read it. And answereth to Jerusalem. And answereth to Jerusalem. Which now is and is in bondage with her children. And now is and in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem which is above is free. Hold up. But Jerusalem which is above is free. Which is the mother of us all. That's really the true homeland. Not Mecca. Not Arabia. The real homeland for us. The place that 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 bear us from the beginning, that's Jerusalem. That's what we should be looking forward to. Not following what's going on with the Arabs or the Romans, the deceivers. See, and that's why the majority of religions in this earth attack Paul. He was exposing them. Why? Because they were looking to be the authority because they were born first. Ishmael was born before who? Isaac. So Ishmael feels slighted. Esau was born before our father, Jacob. So Esau feels slighted. 
So they came together once we, once we fell and conspired against us to split us under their religion to serve both of them as the younger brother. See? And while we were asleep, they came together and created a Mount Sinai and deceived everyone. But the Most High, I thank the Most High, he preserved his word true, which gives us a map back. Back to where? The law. And before it's over, brothers and sisters, that's where we'll be right before the coming of Christ. With that, we have the Academy tomorrow. And if anyone have any announcements or any questions based on what I've just went over, because there's only one part of it. I'm going to cover up more parts within the Academy coming up. But I wanted to put that out there. And I wanted to say this also. We don't hold back anything when we teach on the Sabbath. We teach as the Most High give us utterance and understanding every Sabbath. And I'm saying that because some people out there claim that the academy is where we do certain things and we're not teaching the people. We're holding it. No, we're not doing that. The whole thing is the academy is a structured class. That's what that is. That's separate from a Sabbath lesson. But everything we teach usually comes at some time or the other on the Sabbath. We're not holding nothing back. But for those, but a lot of brothers and sisters value the academy based on the time that's put in and what they get in a short amount of time, the structure that's placed in it. So you can learn the Hebrew and, you know, learn certain history. And then after that, we have the weekly news where Shapat comes in. Then you have the class. It's a structured class. You understand. So it's structured from week to week, just like a regular school would be, so that we can build a foundation without uh, uh, the naysayers and without the scoffers and without those who just come in to disrupt and cause issues. It allow us a platform to just teach with brothers and sisters who are in the spirit to receive. So I wanted to put that out there. And we're going to be together tomorrow with it. Sir. My brother. What's the lesson tomorrow? Tomorrow is the breakdown on modern day Christianity. So this segue right into tomorrow with the modern day Christianity. We're going to teach everything on Christianity. We're going to go into Mary's bloodline, Joseph's bloodline, the Christian deception as far as Constantine, how he brought in Babylonian teachings and made us believe it's Christ. So we're going to be dealing with that tomorrow. But all in all, uh, it's been a blessed Sabbath. And I wanted to identify that. Why? Because so many brothers and sisters out there want to know, well, where's the geographical locations according to the scriptures? Where's the wilderness? What's, so this, with, with what we put out today, and I want to go back to that real quick. What we went in today, you can research it yourself. Look up the 12 pillars. Look up the rock of Horeb. Look up the altar of the calf, the golden calf. Look up the Gulf of Aquaba. Look up the true crossing and not the crossing where the Arabs and the, the, the Arabs and the Christians have come together with their lives. Look up the true crossing over that area, the Gulf of Aquaba. And you can see we went right around. We couldn't go straight through it. We went down and around the mountainous areas. Then we crossed the Gulf of Aqaba into Arabia. And guess what? There you have 12 palm trees. You have palm trees. The same palm trees we went into on each side, they're still there. The palm trees. Everything. The palm trees, the 12 pillars, everything is called the Jebel Al-Laws. That is the place of the mount that has a gate in front of it, warning people not to come on the other side of that antiquity, that antiquity, that, that antiquity. excuse me, get a little tongue, tongue tied there. That antiquity belongs to us. 
It's, it's our God's mount. And when the Most High split the streams in that area, like it says in Isaiah, the 11th chapter, the remnant will be protected by the Most High for a time. If it be the Most High's will, we'll all be there. And Israel will, will be protected in that area before the coming of Christ. With that, I'm going to say shalom, and I can't wait till tomorrow, modern day Christianity. And then after that, right, we'll get ready for um, the elders and deacons class, which is uh, what, Tuesday's nights. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we also, for Thursday nights, have the Sisters of Administrations classes where they're learning also leadership tenants and things they must apply to help the elders and deacons in position okay and uh just want to put that all out there the church is going fine things are moving and i want to thank the brothers and sisters all of you i want to thank all of you out there who support and follow and operate with the church you know the church is within you and and we can see its growth and 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 we're humble with how the most high is using a lot of you to do much to do great work and to extend the church in your respective areas with that we will see you tomorrow right yes sir all right all right so we can answer a few questions and wish you all god's speed.